Uh, we're going to start with Helmut Pastrick, and let me tell you a little bit about Helmut. He is the chief economist for Central One Credit Union, the umbrella organization for credit unions in BC and Ontario, with 3.5 million members. Central One serves more than 300 credit unions and other financial institutions, providing financial, digital banking, and payment products and services from coast to coast. Prior to joining Central One in 1997, Helmut spent many years with the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, analyzing and forecasting on the housing markets and the economy. He's past president of the Association of Professional Economists of BC, a member of the Canadian Association for Business Economics, and a member of the BC Economic Forecast Council. I guess he knows some stuff, hey? So without further ado, Helmut Pastrick. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you for that uh, introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my uh, pleasure to be back here and talk about the economy. And in the past year, uh, many events have unfolded, um, uh, particularly, uh, you know, on the policy front. So we've seen uh, trade policy actions implemented. We've seen housing policy uh, implemented. And that has had a significant impact on the economy and the housing markets. Uh, and the, in general, uh, we've seen 2018 uh, reflect that with slower, slower growth and, in fact, and on the housing front, uh, even uh, contractions. Uh, the outlook, at least in the near term, is that for more of the same. Uh, I would expect the first half of 2019 to be uh, sh still show relatively poor economic performance, or housing likewise, uh, but I am a bit positive uh, on the second half of the year. Uh, not overly, but somewhat more positive on the second half of the year. So I'll just uh, go through uh, my outline here and talk about where the economy is going, what are some of the main risks. And there's more and more talk about Canada heading in, falling into a recession. So I'll address that to some extent, and then I'll turn to BC and then the uh, housing outlook. And let's just get, dig right into it. Uh, the first uh, graph, uh, and I'm an economist, so I rely on data, evidence. <laughs> and uh, what I'm showing you here is the most uh, current available indicator of the global economy. Uh, it is a, what's called the Purchasing Managers Index, and it's compiled across about 40 different countries, representing about 75 to 80 percent of world GDP, and essentially the uh, information obtained uh, from these purchasing managers are what's the state of your current business, uh, how are the orders flow, what's your input cost, are your hiring intentions, and so forth. So it's all aggregated into one measure. And uh, the way this works is that anything below zero indicates contraction. Anything above zero indicates expansion or growth. But clearly, as you can see, uh, the, the red line is manufacturing, and that's through to uh, January. A definite slowdown has played out at the, in the world manufacturing scene. On the services side, non-manufacturing, we tend to see a little more robust activity, but still, uh, the trend line is beginning to turn. And we can... Uh, really point to the manufacturing side, what's happening on the export side. Trade-related activity is clearly deteriorated. So this is the measure of export orders, and you can see the red line is now below zero, contracting. New orders are well, effectively at zero. I would expect the next month's uh, data to come out probably below zero. So very negative signs on the, on the manufacturing front. And it's really spread across uh, the main economies, China, Japan, Europe. Uh, the U.S. is generally holding up. Uh, but overall, uh, clearly, it's, it's, uh, for the global economy, it's clearly slowing down. Uh, China, of course, now the uh, second largest economy in the world. Uh, these are the latest measures, again, through to uh, January. And the green line is their estimate of the PMI index for manufacturing. And it is below zero. So it's contracting. On the services side, or as they term it, non-manufacturing, still growing. Uh, but again, the slowdown is in effect. It has been for quite some time. And when you think about China's economy, how it's expanded over the past, what, three or four decades, you, know, you would normally expect growth to slow down it's just by pure arithmetic. The base is growing larger and larger every year, so the percentage changes naturally shrink. Uh, and, uh, of course, now we're seeing a slowdown due to, well, uh, trade-related matters. To some extent, the impact of previous uh, tightening measures that China imposed, and now the opposite is occurring. China is now beginning to apply policy stimulus to try to revive growth. So cutting, uh, cutting interest rates, uh, making more credit available, and fiscal stimulus as well. <clears throat> Trade policy, probably the largest single risk 
uh, for the global economy, and this is uh, trade policy uh, implemented uh, under the U.S. administration, or Trump, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> and uh, one of the first things he did, withdraw from the TPP, renego renegotiate NAFTA, the uh, tr uh, trade agreement with South Korea, apply duties on solar panels, washing machines, steel, aluminum, and then, of course, the big one is really the impact of the duties that applied on China. Uh, initially, it was on the first 50 billion worth of imports, 25%, and then 10% uh, on the uh, next, if you will, uh, 200 billion of imports. Now, because negotiations are underway, uh, it was the, those, uh, that tariff on the 200 billion was going to kick up to 25% January the 1st of this year. But with negotiations underway, that has been uh, delayed. And so we'll see how that plays out. But uh, Trump is uh, threatening tariffs on all Chinese imports and as well as on all auto and auto parts imports. So uh, he is a disruptor, to say the least. <clears throat> and of course, he's dealing with the, with the issue of the deficit. And uh, this is a graph depicting the deficit with the five, U.S. five largest trading partners. So the blue represents the uh, U.S. exports to those countries. Uh, the yellow green represents U.S. imports from those countries. And the red diamond is the net difference. So China, uh, with ch the, the trade uh, with China, uh, is a uh, deficit of about 350 billion. Now this is in 2017. And this represents both goods and services. Now, the U.S. has had a trade deficit since the early 1970s. It has increased pretty well every year. It, is, uh, it generally has a trade deficit in goods with practically every country in the world. But it has a trade surplus in services with practically every country in the world. But overall, uh, it has a, a significant trade deficit. And, and it's, in 2018, it has actually grown. Canada is down at the bottom, so we're roughly in balance when it comes to both goods and services trade with the U.S. But are tariffs the best way to handle this issue? Well, uh, no. The answer is no. <laughs> That's, that was an easy one. Uh, the better measure would be to, it's really, the, the deficit is a, is a fundamental imbalance between savings and investment in the U.S. Or another way to, turn, to look at that between consumption and the amount of income it's, uh, the U.S. produces. It's basically uh, consuming more, if you will, than it produces or, or and generates an income. Um, impact of tariffs, uh, you can see the list that, I, that I've uh, showing you there. And on the graph depicts uh, the U.S. Consumer Price Index measure for laundry equipment. <laughs> and, and the reason I'm showing you that is because steel, aluminum tariffs went into effect March of 2018, and look what happened to the price. So producers obviously pass it on to consumers. So uh, clearly it's, it's uh, uh, a negative uh, overall. And uh, you can see the, the impacts there. Um, now, some countries may well benefit. So if you're producing steel or aluminum or some other good that's subject to tariff to the U.S. that, that, is, that is not subject, then you might, uh, you might benefit. Uh, you might obtain some market share that way. But that's, that's uh, really not, not the uh, uh, primary uh, impact here. We'll talk about the U.S. economy. <clears throat> And this graph, uh, I know it's rather busy, but it depicts the U.S. economic recovery in the post-war era for every re recovery phase. So there have been 11 economic recoveries or expansion phases in the post-war era. The red line represents the current one. And so the, this measure begins at zero at the bottom of the recession that, for that relevant time period. And we are now uh, the second, it's now the second longest economic expansion phase in the U.S. Uh, but it's also the weakest. And the reason that, of course, is what caused the, that recession, which was the financial crisis. The most severe economic recession in the U.S. has experienced since the Depression. Uh, it resulted in very high unemployment. It resulted in very tight monetary conditions. And, uh, and other factors have come into play as well uh, that caused this uh, very weak, weak uh, economic expansion. 
here's the sort of the normal way of, oh, sorry, of looking at it. <clears throat> this is the actual showing you real quarterly GDP, the blue line. And I've simply smoothed it out to give you a better sense of the underlying trend. There's a lot of ups and downs in these economic uh, me performance measures. Uh, as I said, the 2008-2009 uh, recession was the worst in the post-war era. Since then, you know, growth has been sort of chugging along, albeit up and down, uh, roughly 2 2.5%. Again, very, the weakest recovery phase uh, as well. And that oil recession that played out in, in the early part of 15, you can see the dip that occurred there. Uh, certainly the, uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was implemented by uh, the U.S. administration had some uh, positive impact on, on the last couple of uh, GDP quarters there for 4% you know, growth, 3% growth, but uh, that is going to uh, diminish over time. The, the, with this long expansion, the labor market in the U.S. is tight. Uh, has tightened very steadily. And now there are, there are more job openings, the red line, than there are unemployed. So wages are rising. There, there's pressure in the labor market. And, and albeit it's been a very weak uh, lab, wage response up until now, it's now growing at about 3%, 3.5%. But it is picking up. And that is certainly one reason why we see, uh, have seen monetary tightening, if you will, uh, or rate normalization by the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve. Uh, this graph simply uh, shows you the actual annual uh, GDP growth for the U.S. economies. So again, relatively weak in 2016, uh, moderate in 2017, but 2018 is going to be around that 3%. Uh, we don't have the final number yet, and that's why it's in that forecast uh, region. And what I'm showing you here are forecasts from a survey of about 60 to 70 economic forecasters that that are canvassed every month by the Wall Street Journal. And I'm showing you the, uh, the, the median result of those, uh, that uh, survey. It's also the low. So some eco economists are predicting a recession uh, to play out. Now, these are annual numbers. Uh, and the uh, 2020 number is not, not below zero, but uh, they do have uh, recessions built into their quarterly pattern. And some economists are actually more optimistic, expect uh, much, much higher growth. So uh, how it's going to play out, uh, we'll wait and see. I lean towards uh, more the, the median line, but certainly a slowdown is widely expected for 2019 relative to 2018. And again, in 2020, uh, some of that fiscal stimulus is going to be, uh, begin to fade away. But the U.S. economy, uh, I think, will continue to grow. Oh, and that red line I showed you with all that spaghetti graph will probably turn out to be the longest expansion in the post-war era. Because after all, as, as that headline said, expansions uh, you know, don't, don't sort of uh, expire because of old age. They, typically, there has to be some sort of uh, trigger, some sort of uh, shock event, or some a series of, of uh, conditions where there are significant imbalances. That causes a recession, <clears throat> not old age. Uh, the, unlike humans. <laughs> but uh, when you look at the uh, Federal Reserve, the central bank, uh, uh, they produce projections uh, on a quarterly basis as to where they expect their key policy rate to, to be. And uh, in September of 2018, before we had the sort of that very negative uh, fourth quarter, uh, they were expecting about three or four quarter point increases uh, through to the end of 2020 and 21. Uh, the uh, new set of forecasts uh, that came out in December had a downshift. But interestingly, the green line, the, the market, the, future, the Fed Fund's futures market is actually ex pricing in a, the odds of a rate cut. So there's a real divergence in, in uh, expectations here between what the market expects and how the actual policymakers are, view uh, the future. So. Uh, I lean towards the policymakers. I think what we've seen uh, in the financial markets really began in roughly early October. And December was a very poor month for the equity market, the bond market. We've since seen a rebound. And I think uh, the mark financial markets reaction was really disconnected to economic fundamentals. And uh, therefore, I would uh, classify that as being an overreaction, overdone uh, in terms of uh, the underlying fundamentals. <clears throat> So is Canada heading for a recession? <clears throat> you can find commentary in the local media. Uh, most frequently, uh, it's cited that uh, we have high household debt levels. And of course, anyone with a mortgage that was cast at three, four, five years ago, coming up for renewal is going to face a higher mortgage rate, and that could lead to uh, debt servicing problems and potentially defaults. Uh, and some talk about a housing crash as causing, bringing down the Canadian economy. I lean to the latter. The last point. To, if you look at the history of uh, Canada's business cycles relative to the U.S. and, and, the, and others' major economies, typically 
It's an external event, external to Canada, that causes uh, economic recession. Of course, the uh, primary example would be 2008-2009. Uh, when we had the financial crisis. It, we didn't have a financial crisis in Canada. It was in the U.S. It was in parts of Europe. And we were hit by the backwash, uh, if you will. Uh, and uh, so typically it's an external event. Uh, yes, it's possible that we could have a domestically driven uh, set of circumstances that brings Canada into a recession. That's conceivable. Uh, but at this point, uh, I don't see those, uh, that condition uh, being present. <clears throat> This is a graph depicting uh, uh, quarterly GDP growth and also that trend line as well. And the, uh, the recession of 2008, 2009 was rather garden variety, rather average. It was not the worst in the, since the depression. In fact, 1981-82 was the worst since in the post-war era. Uh, you can see the impact of the oil recession 2015, uh, the blue couple of blue dots below zero. Uh, that doesn't qualify as a recession. Uh, it was too narrow, uh, and, was, and it was not deep enough, uh, nor broadly based. Uh, but growth in Canada, really, again, we've had these ups and downs uh, as well. Uh, it's really ra rather moderate 2% uh, uh, growth rate. <clears throat> Here's a graph depicting household debt uh, relative to uh, dis household uh, disposable income, and it's now leveled out. Uh, somewhere around oh, 175, uh, just under 180% of uh, disposable income. And again, commentators and others will cite this as being unsustainable and uh, again, a potential uh, cause for uh, uh, subsequent economic downturn. Uh, I don't view it that way. It really depends on uh, the quality of the debt, what's, be, what's behind this. Uh, the fact that it's leveled out is, uh, one could view it as a positive sign. And by the way, this measure has been growing for the past three or four decades, right? Uh, in some countries, it's even higher than this. And, and uh, so it uh, really depends on the quality of the debt. Uh, this is a graph depicting the components of uh, overall household debt uh, in dollar terms. And of course, about two thirds is uh, mortgages, residential mortgages. Uh, the uh, orange segment are consumer credit, uh, credit cards, et cetera, and then non-mortgage loans. So on the mortgage front, <clears throat> really the quality of mortgage uh, mortgages that have been underwritten has improved considerably since the great financial crisis. The federal regulators and the provincial regulator, which uh, regulates credit unions, have implemented and demanded much better underwriting criteria. Uh, and for example, uh, you know, we've had the, in 2016, we had that first stress test that the federal government uh, or, or regulator imposed in October of 2016, and that was on NHA insured mortgages. So you had to qualify at the higher uh, rate, uh, the, the posted rate, 2% uh, above your contract rate. And then stress test number two came along in January of uh, 2018. Uh, it's called the B20 uh, guidelines, stress test uh, uh, using the uh, Bank of Canada's five-year posted fixed rate and it's currently 534. Uh, if your contract rate uh, is, uh, let's say, 3% uh, at your local credit union, well, you still have to qualify at the 534, right? So that really uh, narrowed the uh, uh, number of potential buyers. Uh, FICO scores, the last time I looked at FICO scores for NHA insured mortgages, it was above 750. And the FICO score scale, if you remember, goes from 300 to 900. So a very high quality uh, of mortgages uh, there. I think this reset issue uh, concern uh, will not be a major stumbling block. It may be minor in, in aggregate. Certainly it's major for anyone facing that situation. Uh, but in aggregate, I expect it to be relatively minor impact uh, overall. Assuming we don't fall into an economic recession. Of course, unemployment, loss of income is typically the, the, the main trigger for defaults. <clears throat> Uh, you can see the housing market, the flow of uh, residential uh, uh, credit has slowed considerably, um, and particularly since the B20 guidelines were implemented uh, in January of uh, 2018. So that's a pretty substantial decline. Uh, it, was, it was softening before that, and the rate of flow of new mortgages certainly had uh, peaked before this, uh, but uh, it's really have come, has come down considerably and will continue. This is only through to the third quarter of 2018. So the fourth quarter number will be lower and I would expect the first quarter of 2019 to be lower still. <clears throat> 
just quickly turning to, uh, to the oil situation, uh, uh, clearly that has been an issue, and that's one of those external factors that can uh, uh, cause a recession. We had that oil recession in 2015, but it wasn't long enough or deep enough to bring down, uh, you know, to, to classify it as a typical Canadian economic recession. There certainly was a recession in Alberta. There was, that was, that's pretty clear. Uh, and what we've seen lately, we did have that very wide differential between uh, WTI and uh, Western, Ca Western Canada Select. That's the oil price that the Canadians receive or Alberta producers receive. And the differential just widened out considerably, almost up to $40. It has since uh, come back to more normal levels. Now, the Alberta government did help by announcing those production cutbacks. Uh, that's uh, in effect for January. Uh, there was some talk about easing them in for February and March, given that we have seen uh, prices come back. So we'll wait and see on that. But uh, uh, certainly oil is always uh, one of the more important uh, commodities driving the world economy. Uh, the Bank of Canada releases its economic forecasts uh, every quarter. And uh, the blue bars represent uh, its expectations uh, in October of 2018. Uh, the forecasts that came out in early of January this year are the red bars. And you can see the downgrade that occurred in, in the expectation for the uh, 2018 fourth quarter uh, GDP. These are at annual rates. So a full percentage point uh, downgrade. Uh, expectations for the first quarter of 2019, what we're in now, uh, less than 1% growth. And for the year as a whole, uh, downgrade to uh, 1.7, up for previously expecting 2.1. So fairly substantial. And of course, the oil situation plays into that, as well as the uh, slowdown in the global economy, uncertainty over trade uh, policy uh, going forward. So they're basically on hold, uh, just like the central bank in uh, the U.S. Uh, be, uh, data dependent is, an, uh, is another way to look at it. <clears throat> This is my expectation for interest rates uh, for this year. The red line is the Bank of Canada target rate, uh, and the, green, the blue line is the uh, Government of Canada 10-year bond yield. So I do expect uh, some movement, uh, not in the near term. So I expect the Bank of Canada to be on hold right through to later this year. I do expect to see the global economy begin to generate some better numbers uh, in response to the stimulus that is now uh, being implemented and more likely uh, in China, for example. Uh, some other countries are beginning to engage in stimulus to, to uh, pick up growth. Uh, the European situation, which has been really uh, uh, hit by a number of factors, Brexit being one of them, but also some other factors that are uh, uh, likely temporary. So I would expect the European economic numbers to be begin to pick up in a second half of the year as long as well as China so uh, I think the the global outlook will begin to improve and uh, with the oil prices have coming back into that $50 range 55 maybe even 60 uh, I think conditions will be such that there'll be a Bank of Canada increase by a quarter point but uh, uh, you know I, I'm not 100% certain quite frankly uh, we could see no rate change uh, uh, going forward for the next uh, uh, several quarters really uh, there's even some economists uh, if you're in the recession camp who would say well there will be a rate cut at some point in the future uh, I'm not there yet I think we'll see uh, uh, generally moderate growth uh, uh, and uh, the, either the Bank of Canada on hold or maybe just nudging it up uh, a little bit I'll just quickly turn to uh, BC uh, these are annual numbers both for the uh, economy and for employment growth and we've come through a couple of very strong years in 2016 2017 we had three and a half four percent growth uh, 2018 uh, you know we're employment growth only about one percent uh, and real GDP, which is my estimate, StatsCan has not released its uh, uh, figures yet, uh, closer to 2%. Uh, part of that has to do with, uh, uh, I think, a lack of labor supply. Uh, the other measures on the labor market in BC showing fairly tight conditions. Uh, you know, our unemployment rate is, is somewhere in that four and a half percent range. Uh, the job uh, labor demand measures are showing still very good growth. Uh, uh, so uh, I think part of this reason we're only seeing that one percent uh, or saw the one percent in 2018 was supply constraint. Not enough labor. If we had more labor uh, supply, we'd probably see more employment and probably more uh, GDP growth as well. <clears throat> Uh, just turning quickly to housing, these are annual sales, uh, MLS and non-MLS, uh, beginning in 1976. I like sometimes to take the long view. A lot of cycles. And uh, we're currently, uh, obviously, in a contractionary phase. Uh, uh, 
Are we approaching the bottom? Well, I think we're getting close. We're probably not quite there yet, but we're getting close. Uh, and the, this cycle tends to, uh, you know, these factors driving this cycle are really common to practically all markets. Interest rates, uh, state of the economy, uh, typically external factors, housing policy obviously uh, comes into play uh, and applying to, uh, to all, all, across all housing markets. Uh, when you look at pricing, uh, these are, this is a median price. Uh, uh, these are annual numbers. Uh, for 2018, uh, uh, we only have data through to November. So again, these are MLS and non-MLS combined. Uh, the red line represents, it's my attempt to get a sense to strip out inflation. So what's the quote unquote the real housing price? So I'm using the BC Consumer Price Index. It's not the, uh, the ideal measure, but it's the, the best available. Uh, so even when you adjust for overall inflation, uh, prices have still risen very steadily. And of course, it's really a function of uh, supply demand, isn't it? Uh, you can look at uh, on the demand side, how our population has grown over the past uh, four decades uh, plus. Uh, and certainly we, have tend to, we do have a constrained land supply, so it really means higher prices. And this uh, is occurring in most markets, not just in BC, but in most uh, jurisdictions, uh, whether it's uh, you know, across Canada, certainly some markets don't have uh, population growth. Okay, I can point to some markets in BC where you, you won't see this pattern. Uh, and that's because of their local economies, uh, that mine is closed or the main employer is down and so it's, it's quite, quite different. <clears throat> Another way to look at that is uh, just look at the rates of change of, of prices. The, again, these are annual data. Uh, the current uh, uh, pricing uh, is of course slowing down. In fact, if I had monthly numbers, you would begin to see contraction. Overall, the level is declining. Uh, but this particular price cycle, at least uh, based on BC, hasn't been particularly robust. If you look at the 1980, 80, uh, market, now that was a boom market. Look at the price increases that occurred, doubled, well, 30%, you strip out inflation, it was almost 20%. Uh, this time around, we, we got to around, at least by this measure, you know, 10% uh, or so. Um, uh, granted, it occurred over a number of years, so you know, certainly uh, prices uh, since 19, 19, so, sorry, 2015 are up probably 60%, even with the, some price dec decreases in the past uh, couple of months. Population growth in BC, certainly an important uh, driver, uh, still growing at a, between one, one and a half percent. And of course, the main driver is, uh, oops, sorry, is uh, international. So this is the net flows uh, international uh, and has risen quite considerably. So immigration targets in Canada have been raised to about 340, 340,000, 350,000. Uh, the NPRs I'm referring to there are non-permanent resident categories. So those are, are, are people here on permits, typically work permits, student permits, special visas, that, that kind of thing. Uh, and again, a reflection of our, I think, uh, uh, the fact that we do need more labor, <laughs> interestingly. You know, the demographic impact, guys like me, you know, we're kind of drifting out of the labor market increasingly. Uh, so uh, we need more entrance into the labor market. The red line represents uh, uh, the flows between BC and other provinces. And when Alberta was in recession, we had a net inflow, so it was a nice pickup. Uh, that, of course, has turned around, and that uh, we've seen a shrinkage there. And BC and Ontario is the other important uh, component there. And Ontario economy is uh, growing at a, at a moderate rate uh, uh, overall as well. So I'll just close with my uh, forecast, uh, some just very headline numbers. Uh, real GDP around two, two and a half percent. Employment uh, somewhere in that uh, similar, you know, below two percent range, uh, lower unemployment rates. So wages should continue to begin to uh, push up at a faster pace. Uh, population growth roughly the same. Uh, uh, residential sales, I see another decline this year in the number of unit sales. Not as large as last year, so we're, I do expect to see that unit sales cycle hit bottom sometime this year. Let's call it mid-year, roughly. Uh, and uh, after, and then, but prices uh, will, will begin to uh, fall off. Now, they have already declined if you look at the monthly data. Uh, so these are, again, annual numbers that I'm showing you here. Uh, so the uh, decline from, if you, if you take from the peak to uh, what might be the bottom, could be 10, 15 percent, somewhere in that vicinity, depending on markets. So, uh, but uh, I do expect to see uh, uh, that sales begin to pick up. Perhaps, uh, you know, the second half of the year. If not then, then I would expect in 2019. Uh, and after all, one of the best cure for low prices is low prices. Low prices will bring in 
those who have been on the sideline, those who have been priced out, those who are waiting to get into the market. And that will happen. It happens every cycle. As we see, we come out of recession. It's those that begin to uh, come into the market and, begin, and then we see a pickup. And then that ripples through the uh, uh, rest of the, uh, the, the housing market. So uh, we're not in a crash uh, overall. And of course, housing policy, uh, you know, has really been the, the main factor. Uh, we talked about the B20 regs, what the federal government has done, but also provincial government, even local governments, the uh, speculation tax, foreign buyers tax, just lump it all together. It's all about it's housing policy, it's policy-induced recession, housing recession, really. So with that, I will close. Uh, not a very bright note, is it? <laughs> but I do expect a pickup. <laughs> Do I have time for a question? One, maybe one. Two. We'll see how we do by the end. But maybe if there's any off the floor now, we can take them. Please. I'll be I'll be around after the break as well. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, that's possible. There's there's rumors of the. Uh, uh, some easing in, in the uh, uh, underwriting restrictions. It could be uh, easing on the stress test itself. Uh, it could be, uh, say, increasing the amortization period. But yes, some measure. I've even heard talk of, uh, of some sort of other, perhaps, financial incentive. So yes, politicians have a way of uh, coming up with these <laughs> types of uh, programs uh, just in time for the election. Uh, and uh, it has happened in the past, and we may well see it again. And quite frankly, my personal view is that uh, all of these regs uh, that began really after the financial crisis is really overdone. Uh, the Canadian financial system uh, is in very, very good shape. Uh, it's one of the best in the world. We have high capitalized capital levels, liquidity. And so the concerns that the housing market will crash, there'll be defaults on mortgages, and that the financial system was unable to absorb that, I, I think is somewhat misplaced. And so, but we've seen this, uh, the great financial crisis uh, caused this mind shift, this policy shift across uh, most uh, modern economies. Uh, and at least in Canada, uh, I think it was, it was overdone. But uh, that's just my personal view. So thank you. That's great.